located on the northwest coast of Malaysia, Penang's culture is derived from its ethnic and religious diversity. In this vlog, we explore our top five cultural attractions that we found around the island. Near our apartment, in the back of the Gurney Paragon Mall, a restored 19th century monastery houses an incredible history museum. The Straits and Oriental Museum houses a collection of mostly Chinese porcelain that was salvaged from wrecks off the Malaysian coast. Southeast Asia was a major part of the Maritime Silk Road that connected Asian and European trade. China exclusively produced high-quality ceramics for 2,000 years before Europeans were able to replicate it. And the lure of ceramics, silks, and spices ultimately brought European ships who would colonize the region. The wrecked vessels were from different nations and eras. The fragments painstakingly reassembled by archaeologists. The partially complete ceramics make you appreciate the skill that went into the others all that much more. Southwest of Georgetown, on the slopes of Penang Hill, Kek Lok Si, Hokkien for Supreme Joy Temple, is the largest Buddhist temple in Malaysia and a pilgrimage site for Buddhists from all over Southeast Asia. An entire temple complex, it was built over 40 years from 1890 to 1930. The lowest level is the tortoise pond, which, as the name implies, is home to hundreds of tortoises. The next tier can be reached by funicular or by the slower and uglier walking route. This tier contains the actual Kek Lok Si building, a focal point for the Penang Chinese Buddhist community. It also provides impressive views of the city below. This tier also has several other temples of different styles. As well as plenty of souvenir shops. But a main draw in the complex is the White Pagoda of the Thai King Rama VI, though it was closed on the day of our visit. The final tier can only be reached by funicular unless you want to walk all the way down and walk all the way back up on the access road, which we definitely did not want to do. This final level has some beautiful buildings and statues of the 12 Chinese zodiac symbols. But the most impressive piece is the 120 foot tall bronze statue of Kuan Yin the goddess of mercy, Penang's de facto patron for Chinese Buddhists. Unfortunately, we couldn't get up close because of the continued construction. In the heart of old Georgetown, Armenian Street is part of the UNESCO Heritage City area, though it's actually the area bounded by Armenian and Aceh streets. The streets got their names in 1808 to reflect Armenian Christian traders who settled in the area and Muslim immigrants from Aceh, now in Indonesia. The heart of the Aceh neighborhood is the 19th century mosque which grew into a base for Southeast Asian Muslims and was a major stopping point for pilgrims on Hajj to Mecca. At the top of Aceh Street, Syed Alatas Mansion built by a prominent Achi resident, currently serves as the Penang Islamic Museum. By the 1880s, 
the Armenian residents had mostly moved out and wealthy Chinese merchant clans moved in. In 1910, Dr. Sun Yat-sen visited this community as part of his fundraising efforts for the revolution against the Qing Empire. The Chinese clans also built elaborate temples that are still in use today. One of the standout stops on Armenian Street is the Batik Art Museum, housed in a gorgeous colonial heritage building. Batik is an Indonesian wax resist cloth dyeing technique where each layer of color is isolated with wax. The museum has collected pieces from all around Asia, displaying skill that we never knew existed. Some of the results are simply stunning considering that each layer of color is individually waxed and applied. This piece of Batik pointillism is incredible. Next to the museum, you can buy some of the best baklava we've ever had. Other sites around Armenian Street are restaurants and shops, and street art. often visited by large tour groups. A land reclamation project was near our apartment, and reclamation has been part of Georgetown since the 1880s. Beach Street was once the waterfront. From 1883 to 1889, land was reclaimed out to Weld Key to expand the port, and Beach Street was developed into the prime real estate it is today. The expanded port brought workers from Fujian province in China who couldn't afford land or expensive rent, so they built their homes over the water. Residents had the same family name and hometown. Lim Jetty is the first one that we visited, which peaked in size before World War II when it was burned down during Japanese bombing attacks. Today, several families still live there and during the day, visitors are allowed around the neighborhood and to the shrine at the end of the jetty. The temples on the street side are open 24 hours a day. There are five other jetties left today, all recognized by UNESCO, but not all open to the public. Tan Jetty was similar to Lim, But Chu Jetty is something altogether different. The largest, most visited, and most touristy, they've really cashed in on the UNESCO status. The Chu clan temple at the front of the jetty is beautiful, elaborately and brightly decorated. And their Lunar New Year celebrations are supposed to be some of the best available in Penang. Far south of Georgetown, close to the airport, you can find our final top cultural stop in Penang. Number one place that I wanted to see, and a Vic didn't even want to come along. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? Ban Kalan, Hokkien for Temple of the Azure Clouds, was built in the 1800s to honor an 11th century monk from Fujian, China who achieved enlightenment. Pilgrims from Singapore, Taiwan, and Fujian visit annually on the monk's birthday, which falls during New Year's celebrations. Land to build the temple was carved out of the surrounding jungle, and the neighboring snakes started taking shelter inside the building. Rather than harm or otherwise eliminate them, the temple monk built homes for them. The poisonous pit vipers are sluggish and have been devenomed, but visitors are still advised not to touch them. As the city grew around the temple, the jungle disappeared. So the back of the temple property 
is now a snake breeding ground. Very dangerous. You go first. The clump of trees is strung with donations and red envelopes. And finding the snakes is a bit of a game. At your own risk, of course. They're hard to find, but they are most definitely there. For those who want to be more interactive, non-poisonous snakes are available for a photo op. These pythons are most definitely alive, and their handler is always close by. but this was totally worth the $10 fee. If you enjoyed this journey, click like and subscribe so you don't miss our future episodes.